I would now like to introduce Mike Denger from Trimble, who's been with this initiative from the early days and is going to drive a lot of the actual development work for TechStack 2.0. Mike has done a fantastic job of driving the process to this point, documenting it, and telling the story. So I'm going to let him share it with you now. So thank you, Walt, for that introduction. And um, I'm Mike Dentinger. I'm with Trimble. Uh, a lot of you know as we try to drive tractors straight is our general claim to fame. Um, the ideas that are going to be presented here, and knowing that this is 15 minutes, we're only going to be able to dive so deep, but they're the collective ideas of a group of people who've actually worked quite hard to put this together, to pick a starting point, to get this initiative moving forward. So despite the fact it has Trimble on the logos, on the presentation, it's a collective effort. And um, I've been very impressed with the people who spoke before us today. Many of the themes that they brought up, uh, and I hadn't seen their presentations, will appear here also. And these are evolving as the fundamental challenges for success. Um, Dr. Elber, who spoke just before lunch, really elegantly articulated many of the challenges and the real world scenarios from taking an idea and the roadblocks to getting it into an actual field sustainable solution. So here we go. So people here are in the specialty crops. You know that this industry has headwinds. The crop diversity, the 400 species in California, the harvest timing that has to be very precise or you lose your entire investment. Uh, economics of being a small market segment trying to get high automation, the economics don't work. Um, regulation, equipment complexity, commercial sustainability, all of these things are headwinds to this industry. And if these were easy problems, they would have already been solved. There are actually some good specialty crop harvesters out there, but the majority of the industry is still harvesting by hand. And so we have very simple goals here. Number one, uh, build a harvest automation ecosystem. And the, the success is defined by, and I think Walt mentioned this earlier, 50% uh, of harvest is automated in the next 10 years. It's a very aggressive goal. And as Dave had said, if we fall a little short, we'll just keep going. Okay. Now, here's the strategy on the tech stack. Let's, we visualize the end state. There's many end states, but in the end state, it is a functional, sustainable harvest mechanism that automates and reduces labor, increases safety, increases food safety. We separate the task out. We segment. We div divide and conquer. We identify the gaps that are needed to be filled, and then we have to always propose a very clear, viable commercial model. We're going to use an 80-10-10 strategy, 80% off the shelf, 10% modified off the shelf, 10% new, because platforms are off the shelf these days. GPS RTK is off the shelf these days. Many of the, the uh, implements and things are off the shelf. We heard several of the uh, speakers talk about system integration difficulties, not having someone who can do it start to uh, finish. We're going to try and make that easier. Heavy reuse of components. We, we have several companies, and Trimble's one of them. We, we're in ag, but specialty ag has always been a mystery to us. We can't figure out how we play and how we, we make money, essentially. But by normalizing things, and having common modular architecture, you enable us to size markets and prepare for uh, reuse, and uh, you provide a value proposition. Share, publish, and educate, specialize. And the specialist is let the specialist do what they do best. If you're a robotics guy, don't worry about the tractor. If you're a vision person, don't worry about the robotic arm. And then we, everybody's going to need some patience. We're going to iterate and evolve. That's where we're going to start these top three. Okay, 
here's where we start. And you say, hey, Mike, that's a blank page. And that's not what was intended here. We're going to start with defining the platform interfaces. And then we're going to build out the rest. These are all the elements to make a common modular ar uh, architecture survive. But that's not sufficient unto itself. We have to have the specialty crops industry participate just as heavily in identifying who the producers are, the crop agronomy, the crop uh, harvest uh, methods and, and tactics. All of this becomes a database of uh, information that the modular architecture has to have easy access to. And then let's not forget, we have the harvest solution providers. Without these people, and this is where a lot of things uh, fall apart, you have to have a channel to the market. You have to have service and support. You have to have competition. You have to have these things to have a viable, long-term, sustainable industry. So. All right, that's the end state vision for what we're going to put together, the little blue boxes where we're going to start. Fortunately, after hearing this morning's uh, uh, presentations and knowing that a lot of this we're going to stri strive for off the shelf, we can hopefully rapidly fill out lots of this without tr dramatic effort. All right, let's talk about the elements of a harvest machine. Virtually every harvest machine in the world boils down to four elements. And I put a bunch of harvest machines on here, and I know it's skewed towards uh, the big guys, the corns and the, uh, the um, uh, wheats and the soys. But everybody should recognize the color of machines so no one in the audience is offended. Um, the reality is they all involve four different things. Working left to right, zone one, you have to put the harvest somewhere. The blue in the uh, one over, the zone two, is the power plant could be a platform that you buy, it could be a tractor, it could be something, but it's where the operator will typically sit and it's where the, um, all the efforts of the harvest machine are coordinated. Next is the harvest implement. This is after you've got it off the ground, what do you do with it? You thresh it sometimes, you, you move it to the back, you do something with it. And then the last place is the specialty header. The specialty header it would be unique many times per crop. Specialty headers in, in um, uh, specialty crops right now are human beings. They are the first cutter. They're the, the interface with the earth. They're, they're the interface with the tree. They're the interface with uh, the vine. OK. This picture had a lot more complexity in it, but I was told, uh, boil it down, uh, get it a little simpler. When we talk about the interfaces, there are six interfaces between uh, on a harvester. The first one is between the power plant or the, the platform and the back end where the crop is being stored. These interfaces could involve things like PTOs, hydraulics, high-speed electronics, um, all sorts of sensors, we are going to endeavor to define those in a way that can sustain a path towards full automation. Second one is between uh, looking forward on the vehicle, because a lot of specialty crops are cut ahead of the vehicle. Uh, we're going to do the same thing. It'll look a lot the same. PTO power. If you're a startup working about, uh, worried about hydraulic uh, um, pressures and, and flow rates, um, we want to provide standards and stuff where you can just trust. You don't have to become an expert in that. Moving forward, between the implement and the specialty header, this is where the fun is really going to start. Because we've heard a lot about tech. We've heard a lot about vision systems, machine learning, artificial intelligence, sensors, LIDARs, radars, ultrasonic. We want to define the interfaces to a very high-end processing unit so that the robotics guy does not have to develop the processing unit. They can trust, they can host their controls code with an arm and make things happen. Fourth interface is between the cutter head and the field. And this is really 
where all the money is made or lost because it's one of the most difficult things to do. It's the end effectors picking apples. It's the <coughs> blades cutting lettuce. It's whatever it turns out to be. This is where the real challenges lie at this point in time. We want the best and brightest to focus there. Next interface is between this entire system and the cloud. We're going to move some data. We're going to process data offline. We're going to process data online. But overall, it has to be defined. And that is nearly commoditized at this point in time. But a lot of people don't realize this. They feel that they have to redevelop uh, that entire subsystem. And then the last one is between where the storage tank is or the accumulator is and how you offload to the, uh, the vehicles that will be actually taking the crop either in packages or whatever to the processing plant or storage facility. Okay. So we've looked at this a lot more organically. We have identified uh, several areas that very few companies, if any, can actually do this entire run. We want to make it easier on people so they don't have to become experts in compliance, which involves all sorts of expertise, regulation, uh, building safety, that sort of thing. Food safety. We have a lot of people who can develop robotic arms but don't have a clue about food safety. We don't want them to have to become food safety experts. We want to get food safety boiled down to some real basic things so that the easy stuff we get right. Food safety has a lot of complexity to it, but we want to get the easy stuff right. Precision ag. This is where Trimble plays and a lot of other people, but I can say that for guidance, GNSS, um, controls, uh, this is nearly commoditized. And there's some really good equipment out there. You shouldn't have to worry about building a GPS receiver to run a robotics arm. By the way, in precision ag, one of the key elements is, is that you georeference everything. You have to know where stuff is. You have to know where the permanent crops are. You have to know where the rows are. You have to know where the vines are. And it will come down to, as one of the earlier speakers says, you got to know where each orange or apple is. But it all starts with having a common reference system. It's widely available today in very high quality and reasonably priced. Robotics, sensors, and uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, huge, tons of startups, but this is a herding the cats effort because there are brilliant, brilliant people out there that are doing the same thing over and over again. We have to be able to leverage stuff so we can build upon versus just build more of. Software and hardware infrastructure, this will be a key element. Define an operating system, define uh, a set of interfaces, APIs, that everybody can use and trust so that you can actually focus on what you do best. And this is the most underlooked one, uh, a channel. A dealer network, and, and I put in California because we're in California now, but this is a worldwide issue. You can't <clears throat> expect a farmer to buy something that they have no good faith estimate can be supported, that can have their people trained on, can be repaired in a short amount of time. These logistics are huge. They must be addressed. Field testing and ground test truthing capabilities and the Ag Channel training service and support, um, very underlooked in the industry. Okay, and this will be my last slide. Just to summarize where we're going to go with this, um, use the four quadrant module, uh, the four uh, zone module of a harvester. Use the 80-10-10 rule. Uh, stay uh, basically stay broad in the definitions. We don't be overly prescriptive. Uh, make it crop independent at this point in time because these interfaces are crop independent. They it may not appear so, but they actually are. Focus on uh, the critical things that it were missing. Identify the gaps. Uh, no intellectual property. Walt talked about this, and I'll give a good example. You build the best camera system in the world. Maybe it's a stereo camera that does everything in the world. I don't care how you made it work. 
I want to know how to speak to it. I want to know how to get that data off of it. It's in your best interest to tell us that. If offloading data out of your camera is intellectually property protected, your camera is going nowhere. Or it had better be for free and the best thing on the market. And people will then uh, go with you. But there are plenty of cameras out there. Let's get the interfaces down. Let's identify cameras that are sustainable in the uh, fields and have a, uh, a supply chain and support behind them. So no need for intellectual property uh, to be disclosed. We'll use subject matter experts, as Walt described, to get this off the ground. It's, we're going to use the philosophy, it's much easier to edit than create. And after this very short-term effort, we are going to open it up to a, a wider audience and then a wider audience. We cannot have chaos to start this off. We have to start with a nugget, and we'll build upon that nugget. And then we need a, a secure and sustainable um, data repository, data environment. More than ever, we don't want to get into a situation where the data is not available because we've made it too hard to access. We don't want to make it so easy that it becomes a poor man's Wikipedia. And uh, because we need quality data entered into the system and we need it sufficiently protected. And then the deliverable for this first stage is an interface document and uh, candidates for Sentinel projects to go reduce the risk of the long-term uh, uh, technology path. Thank you.